Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to the Summer of Carnage right here on the Venom Vlog. And today we're going to talk about more Absolute Carnage number one. Obviously, we did our review already, so if you haven't checked that out, please go do it. This episode is going to be you know, semi-spoilers. We're going to talk about specific scenes uh, in this episode. Nothing too crazy. I don't want to get too long-winded into this one. Uh, but there's a couple things that you guys pointed out in my review uh, that, you know, that I felt like I wanted to discuss a little bit more or explain a little bit more. Uh, so we'll do that here. And then also there's like this little cool two-page thing at the end from Ravencroft that has some information in it and some of it not very accurate information. I guess it is to the updated Donny Cates, like changing of the origins, uh, but it doesn't, didn't really sit well with me as far as like being a continuity hound, obviously. Uh, sometimes I feel like changes are made and they're kind of unnecessary changes. Like you could still tell his story without having changed those things. Um, but it's just my opinion on it. So we'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, but it is a cool little thing at the end and it's written by Clay McLeod uh, Chapman who wrote all the one page short stories. And it turns out uh, wrote uh, the Separation Anxiety book that came out this week. And we're gonna talk about that in an upcoming episode pretty soon. Um, but that was, you know, it was neat to see his name again. Cause I was like, oh, who is this guy? I don't really know anything about him. He's doing all these backup one page stories. And then he did the backup in this. like this little two-page interview thing with Ravencroft, uh, but then, you know, goes on to write an entire issue, and it was a strong issue, I feel, too. So we'll get into that very soon. Um, but this one, before we dive into it, because it's going to have spoilers in this episode, boom, there's a digital code right there. I forgot to give it out in the last one, or I didn't forget. I just didn't have a physical copy of the book. Um, but now I have two physical copies. Um, I, you know, thanks to my roommate, he bought me a copy. Uh, he went and picked up my stuff, or gave me a, a gift card, I guess, uh, for my stuff at uh, House of Secrets, which was really nice. So I was able to pick up the physical copy. But then all also, my old roommate, Kevin, uh, he's, I guess, just saw my Instagram lately and my posts and was like, man, dude, life seems like it's kind of kicking you and you're, and you're already down. Uh, and so to like lift my spirits, he picked up my pull list from Golden Apple Comics. And uh, there was also a copy of Absolute Carnage there, too. So these you know, copies come from those guys. So my, my current roommate, Victor, and my previous uh, roommate, uh, Kevin, I will give out both digital codes in this episode. So we just gave out the first one. You saw that already. First person to put that code in uh, gets the full, you know, 60 or 90 page or 60 page comic, full 60 page digital comic. Uh, you will get it if you put that code in. And, uh, don't, you know, that code only works once. So whoever got it, you know, let me know in the comments below if you got it. And if you still want to win one, don't worry, we're going to give out another code throughout this episode. So just stay tuned and I'll drop it, you know, randomly in the episode. Uh, so here we go. Um, the, you know, this scene, uh, the beginning, I talked about how like, you know, this, this exposition to catch us up. Normally I would kind of rail against kind of exposition like this, but this is great because not only is it for new readers, people who may not have been reading Donny Cates' Venom stuff and they just like, you know, keep up with Marvel through event books or something, or they just thought this looked interesting and they're like, oh, I'm not normally a Venom and Carnage fan, but maybe I'll try it. This was kind of a way to bring those people in and, and get them all up to speed. Uh, but then they also use it as a character moment for Eddie to be telling all this to Dylan who does not know this information. So for me, that kind of gave it a pass. I was like, all right, normally I would probably uh, question this, but you know, I'm not going to now because I feel like there's a reason for it. Um, you know, so anyway, I like that stuff. I like the Cletus Cassidy scene where he pushes, you know, uh, Eddie and Dylan out in front of the train. I thought that was really cool because it was like a, a nod back to when uh, Eddie Brock used to terrorize, you know, Peter Parker before he revealed himself to Peter Parker as Venom. Um, but then the, the one thing I talked about was... Um, you know, Eddie Brock, you know, being, you know, I guess framed for murder. And a lot of you were saying like, well, obviously that makes sense. Cletus Cassidy would torment Eddie Brock. He would want to do everything he could to torment him. And you're right. I absolutely agree with that. I'm not saying that uh, framing him is out of character. I'm saying I don't know what it has to do with the overall plan that Null has who Cletus Cassidy is currently serving right now. So yes, there is enough of Cletus Cassidy to probably do things that Cletus Cassidy would normally do, like torment Carn or, or, torment Venom and Eddie Brock and everything like that, which he's doing clearly in the issue. Uh, but there is a bigger goal too. He has a bigger goal this time. Uh, he has a very specific task he's trying to accomplish. And so I'm just kind of wondering why the the framing thing and so i'm like okay but let's just for argument's sake all right it's just him messing with him that's fine that's totally in keeping with cletus cassidy he would torment and poke and prod his victims before he you know kills them uh he seems like that kind of devious kind of person uh someone who will pull the flies you know the, the wings off a fly before he kills it um so yeah i could see that totally being the thing so i'm not railing against that my point is if you're gonna do it you know, keep doing it. Use it to lay the pressure on Eddie. Because to me, I see a great reason to do this. It literally gives Eddie no safe place to hide. And I know a lot of you are going to be like, all right, so that's the reason. It's so Eddie can't go anywhere. He can't, he's, you know, like, until Null and Carnage completely take over the planet, then Eddie is not safe anywhere. He can't hide uh, because there's going to be 
regular people who haven't been turned into symbiotes yet and symbiotes looking for them. Um, so I'm, I agree. I think that's a great thing, but then you need to stay on it. When you put your foot on that gas, it has to stay on that gas. You understand? So when they get to the scene where they're talking in the bar and it's literally Eddie Brock sitting across from Spider-Man, all eyes would be on them because they'd be like, who are these guys sitting in the bar? Unless they went to like, uh, you know, one of those bars for like, uh, you know, um, super powered people or like magicians or whatever. I know that's like a DC thing, uh, but I don't know if there's like a Marvel version of it or if they go to the bar where there's like, it's only for super villains, but still I feel like everyone's eyes would be on Spider-Man and Eddie talking. And eventually someone would look away from Spider-Man and see Eddie and go, Hey, wait, that's the murderer. That's the guy who just escaped from Rikers. What's he doing with Spider-Man? So that should play out in this scene. Cause then it adds to the tension. It just shows that Eddie literally does have no safe place to go. And I know some people will say, well, yeah, but in this scene, that's where they bring in the next thing that, uh, that, you know, carnage is, uh, using to get to Eddie, to get under his skin, which is the pile of dead bodies where Eddie realizes Anne Wang is there. And it's like, yes, but that would be even more heartbreaking and hard for Eddie to deal with if he was also being recognized by everybody around him. And instead of him arguing with the bartender to like turn the TV back on, if he just literally couldn't hear the TV or see what was happening because people were going, hey, that's the guy, that's the guy. And they pull out their phones and they're recording him. Like that just, you know, escalates that scene. Like, 10 times fold and you just you as a reader you can't breathe either along with eddie brock and it just puts you more in that scene so when they're like all right we did this thing where eddie brock is framed and now it's going to make things tough for eddie then when they get to the next thing that's going to make tough for eddie they ignore it they just forget about the first thing and you're just like okay well, okay so but, but why why not have both things you know it, in front of eddie at this point both obstacles and it just makes things even harder to deal with and then when they go and see john jameson john jameson he was like hey that's eddie brock he's you know he escaped from rikers or whatever and spider-man's like oh it's not him come on let's keep moving on and it's like all right so they touch on it again in the third act of this book but in that second act i think it would have just made this scene even harder if uh if these guys if they were talking in a bar if people just started recognizing them and then maybe they had to move from the bar to like a rooftop somewhere to talk. And then Eddie saw, you know, um, you know, the, the report on TV and he's like, I can't hear it. And then as he gets closer, people start recognizing him and he's like, no, wait, what are they saying? You know? And then he goes like, no, that, that's, it's a message from Cletus, you know, Anne's there. So I'm just saying like, I'm, I'm not, I'm just offering an alternative. And this is why it bothers me. I'm just explaining myself of why that scene in particular and that setup bothers me a little bit because I feel like it was abandoned to go on to the next thing. And so I just hope that plays out more in the next issue. I just hope when like wherever Peter and, you know, Eddie go from here in the next issue, uh, wherever next place they go, I hope that stays on. Like it's like keep Eddie framed for murder and keep people looking for him and keep people scared when they see him. If that plays throughout the story, then I won't mind it at all. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. It just felt like it was being abandoned a little bit in a very key scene in this issue uh, just to, you know, give them a moment to breathe and I don't want them to have a moment to breathe. I want them to really just, you know, the pedal to the metal. I want them to keep going with all these things that are making, you know, Eddie's life even harder and making his goal of beating Carnage even tougher. So that's all I'm saying. You know, other than that, I'm fine. Um the rest of the book, I mean, I think I covered most of it in the in the uh, review that we did, but I didn't talk a lot about the third act. And the third act I really did like. Uh, obviously the thing I called out about John Jameson uh being a sleeper agent. Uh we read Cult of Carnage a couple months ago and I was like you know, I bet you, you know, they're just, it seemed obvious to me, even though it was wit, uh, written really well by Frank Thierry, I was like, you know, I think it's going to be, John Jameson's going to be a sleeper agent. And at some point he's going to, you know, turn on Spider-Man and Eddie. And I didn't expect it to happen in the first issue. So when they showed up and they saw him, I was like, Ooh, are they going to drop that ball now? And I was very surprised that they did. And John Jameson was transforming into a man wolf, but under Carnage's influence and under Null's influence. So I thought that was pretty great. And then this scene here where uh, Carnage is walking down the, the hallway um, and he's actually, you know, used the symbiote to like rebuild his face and his hair. Um, he like opens up his chest and pulls out all these little maggots and stuff. And he infects all the inmates and turns them into symbiotes. So what I like is that that Donnie Kate's doing is he's keeping that family theme. Like it seems like no matter what Cletus Cassidy does in some way, he's always trying to build a surrogate family, uh, like in maximum carnage and then carnage USA and stuff like that. And it seems like that's happening here, but that also serves Noel's purposes because Noel wants to take over. Um, so that's great too. And then yes, some people were saying that, um, like I was saying, Oh, I wonder if Cletus will ever turn against Noel um, because I don't see him serving Noel. And some people said, well, yeah, but Noel wants darkness to cover the universe and carnage sees himself as every time he kills somebody, he's freeing them from this existence. 
sense. And it's like, yeah, that's true. But we don't know what happens when Noel takes over. Maybe he doesn't free anybody. Maybe Noel needs everybody to be like in a cocoon or as a symbiote or something that goes against you know, what Cletus wants. Uh, we don't really know fully what Noel wants to do yet. So there's still room there to where Carnage maybe could uh, just see Noel's final plan and be like, you know what? You turning everybody into things to worship you, that doesn't free them. Uh, killing them frees them, you know, and I want to kill them. I want them to be free from this existence uh, because this existence is meaningless and sitting around worshiping you is definitely going to be meaningless. So I'm just saying I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened later on in the story if Carnage ended up turning on Noel when he finds out what Noel's real goals are. Um, but uh, but again, that's just my theory and it doesn't mean I'm right or wrong and I like hearing all of your theories. So keep them coming. Let me know in the comments below uh, what you you know have to say back to this, you know, because I, I read your comments. I'm like, all right, let's factor that in. Let's make another video where we address that and we talk about that and maybe I explain myself a little bit better. So um, yeah, that's what I'm doing here and hopefully guys, uh, whether you like it or not, you know, let me know what you think down below and we'll talk more down there. Um, and then yeah, so then this scene here where Norman Osborn, if you remember, he has the mind of Cletus Cassidy or he thinks he's Cletus Cassidy. Ever since he got separated from the symbiote, I guess the symbiote left enough trace of Cletus inside because remember the suit is kind of Cletus in a way it bonded with him on a blood level uh, it seeped into his you know a cut on his arm and wrapped around his blood and it totally you know turned black and red you know using Carnage's or Cletus Cassidy's blood to you know form itself and so with it bonded to Norman Osborn and then separated you know abruptly he's now kind of thinking he's uh, nor you know he thinks he's Cletus Cassidy so when he's in the cell here and, and Spider-Man shows up and they bust down his door he's like oh is this a threat and he's like and he's talking like he's Cletus Cassidy um and uh, and so Spider-Man is like you know having to fight him and he's you know it's it's fantastic. I love that they kept that in there because that was one of the things after Red, you know, Red Goblin or whatever it was called. I was like, yeah, the story was okay for me, but the ending I liked because I because it had that element. It was like, oh, he thinks he's Cletus Cassidy now, and I'm like, yeah, they'll probably never touch on that again. And it was nice to see them do that here because I thought when they were going to show up to see Norman, he was just going to be like a crazed out Norman. But I was like, oh wow, they actually kept the the carnage thing there. So yeah, I appreciated that. Like I said, I'm kind of a stickler of continuity, and I don't want things changed if they don't have to be. And Donny Cates is making this work for his story and it's working out pretty nicely so far and this book ends in a really big way so i won't spoil the last page you know uh, but what i will do is give out the last you know that last digital code so boom right there there's the other digital code first person to put that in gets the other copy of this book and again thank you to vic and kevin for these copies and thank you to golden apple and to house of secrets for providing those copies to my friends to give to me which is really awesome so enjoy that and uh, then in the last pages of the book we have this Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane. And uh, I like this setup. It's pretty nice. It just has like this, you know, page about Cletus Cassidy. It says when he was born, which is, I think is like really close to the date of his first appearance in Amazing Spider-Man. It even has like Amazing Spider-Man uh, 01, which I guess for volume one. And it says, uh, you know, 0361, which is issue 361. Uh, but then the date is uh, April 7th, 1993, which I think is around the time that, his, that, that issue came out. So I was like, okay, that's kind of a nice little meta reference joke obviously um it can't really be true i you know because he can't have been born in 1993 if <laughs> i guess if that's when the book came out uh but it doesn't matter it's like it's comic book timeline stuff and some of that i'm i'm forgiving of uh, i don't really it doesn't and t when they put a a cap on it that's when i have a problem when they go hey everything that ever happened happened in five years i'm like that's where I start to rail against it. I'm like, just who cares? They're, they're paper people. They don't exist the way we do. So just like their time can move differently than ours. It's fine. I, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, but then he yeah, talks about, uh, you know, his conflict with Spider-Man and suffered shock symptoms and all that stuff. But then it says, uh, mother, parents, uh, patient's mother diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and paternal history uh, unclear. Mother died during childbirth, uh, paternal history unknown. And that's just not true. I mean, in the original comics, um, Cletus Cassidy was not born in Ravencroft. I think that's just so on the nose and such what a modern writer uh, who's trying to do something new would do. So it doesn't surprise me that way. Like I said, I, I've been an editor in comics and I've seen so many stories pitched to me and a lot of Donnie Kate stuff just comes across as like these first draft things that get that have been pitched to me before where I just go dang, I would have really worked with the writer on this one. Um, there's no changing Cletus Cassidy to being born, um, you know, in Ravencroft and having him like choke on his own umbilical cord from birth and stuff. I know I put some of that in my, my Carnage History video. I mean, it's part of continuity now, so I got to kind of include it in videos like that, but I'm still going to rail against it in videos like this where I'm talking to you about it uh, because I'm like, yeah, that's, 
Cletus had a history already. It was he had a mother and a father. He 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 tried to kill the he killed the family dog. He killed his grandmother, I think, pushing her down the stairs. And then his mother was taking a bath, and he tried to throw like um like a hair dryer in that was plugged in to try to electrocute her. She got electrocuted, but she lived uh, barely and tried to kill him. And then Cletus's dad showed up and killed her instead. So if you notice in my history of Carnage video, I try to include both versions. I just I, I included that he was born in Ravencroft and that she died. Um, yeah, his mother died. You know. Know, later on in uh, life when he tried to when he killed her or tried to kill her and then his father killed her and that left him to be an orphan and then he was raised at St. Estes Boys. Um, so for me I'm like yeah that that works you didn't need to have her birth him in an insane asylum and then die at birth that's what happened to Eddie Eddie Brock's mother uh, gave birth to Eddie and died at birth so I can understand maybe he's like oh I want a parallel between these characters and it's like but they, they don't have to have the exact story. You don't have to change it to where they have the exact origin. Um, so it, it's just weird. It's it's funny because I think Donnie Cates mentioned it on one of his podcasts about how there's really no women in like the first five or six issues of the Venom comic book. And it's funny. It's not only are there no women in the comics, but he went out of his way to retcon multiple women <laughs> from the history of Venom comics. Like, uh, or not a, maybe not multiple women, but a couple. Like now Carnage's mom was ne never had a life and, you know, never got married. So he retconned her life at all and just made her a crazy lady. And then uh, he retconned out, you know, um, Eddie Brock's sister. And it's like, yeah, Eddie Brock's sister didn't add a ton to his lore, really. But she did exist and she was someone that you know kind of was part of his tormenting growing up and uh, I don't know if you're going to add like a scene where Eddie Brock hit a kid while drunk driving I think that scene is more powerful if his sister was also there to torment him and stuff like that um, you know when he makes a mistake like that instead of his dad just you know bullying him to keep his mouth shut it would have been interesting to have the sister character still there to add on to that um, that's the thing about Eddie's Brock life is it's relentlessly raining down on him almost like peter parker but just worse in somehow and eddie that's why eddie's an anti-hero and not a full hero because life really does kick him constantly while he's down and anytime he sees a shortcut to potential good things to happen to him uh that shortcut just leads to more disaster and uh, that's what i like about the character is that it's relentless and that's what i want in a pacing for a story like absolute carnage is i just want it to be relentless so when he had that moment where he's talking to peter parker i'm like this is great but i wish it wasn't going on for like 10 pages or 12 pages Pages. I wish it was like three or four pages. You get the, the stuff out you need to get, get the emotional moment in there with Peter talking about not knowing your dad growing up and then, and then lay it on Eddie, you know, make, make it to where he can't breathe and he can't get a moment to himself. Um, that's where I want these stories to go. And that's how I want the story in this event to happen. Um, but then again, those are just my thoughts and then probably the opposite of your thoughts. So if so, let me know down below. And as far as the other special features, you know, we kind of talked about in the last episode, but if you buy the 799 director's cut on Comixology, you'll get, or Amazon, you'll get, um, you know, like all the pages of the book in pencil form. So I'll show like one page there. It's in pencil form. Then you'll get the inked form by JP Meyer. Um, and then I think it's Frank Martin, right? That does the, the color. So there's the color version right there. Um, so yeah, you get those three versions in the book of every page in the book. So it's really great, great way to learn from it. This is a great tool. If you're out there and you want to be an artist or an inker or a colorist or a writer, uh, they also have, you know, Donny Cates's original script put in the back of this book as well. So if you want to see how script formatting is done to a certain extent, or how at least Donny Cates formats his scripts, um, you, can, you can see that in the back of the book. If you want to see how the, the pencils look and how much depth the inks look and how much uh, life that the colors bring, you can see all that on every single page in this director's cut. So I highly recommend picking up for those bonuses because you do get the two-page Ravencroft scene. You do get that no matter what, and whether you buy the physical one or digital one. But if you get the digital copy director's cut, you get all that other stuff that I just mentioned, and it's worth it trust me so uh, let me know what you think this is you know just more thoughts on absolute carnage number one i will be getting because i wanted to do this video first before we got to scream and separation anxiety which came out this week so those will be my next two videos so make sure you stay tuned make sure you stay subscribed so you don't miss out on those and as always join the conversation down below and we'll continue it down there thanks so much for watching the show as always like share, subscribe all that fun stuff and i'll see you in the future peace